Hello. This chorale is sort of the um, essence of the first prelude of the well-tempered clavier from 1722. Bach composed as a didactical exercise and arpeggiated with held values on the harpsichord to create an overlapping legato harmonized chordal, partly not, partly yes, is a residue of the resonances overlap until they sort of dissolve at the higher note of the tenth. And the gestural, um, elegant, rising, escaped design does not drop, it restarts. But the last note of the top is at the end of each beat. So it becomes so that the downbeat of each bar or every two halves of the bar, when you change the harmony in the rhythmic pattern of the tempo of it, since he repeats twice the part, always starts from the bottom up. the importance, not only as if, but to do so emphasize the melodic pattern of the bass line with its punctuation cadences of the dominant or modulation in G major, to be or not to be, secondary dominant or real modulation that is to be known or argued, and ultimately unimportant as long as it's understood in terms of the where you start, through where you go, and where you arrive. And because the melodic line drops of the bass, the tips of the top appear to shine like, I would say, rays of that sun-shining bass line. Naturally, it does not act as a melody in the top. It's more like as if um, it shines from the bass up and it just evaporates when the next harmony materializes. The first degree, the second degree, the fifth degree. The first degree becoming four in G major, but we know it only when we buy the ticket before we travel. And then we accomplish the trip to the dominant where C is the subdominant. Then G, if it was a dominant of C or its own tonic, we becomes five, ultimately to return to C major. So the tonic of C major with the added dominant seventh becoming a five of four. So we have now the subdominant after we hit the dominant. The two pendants. And the chromatic melodic line of the bass has a tortured interval that is so specifically driven to act like a darker cloud in this seemingly shadowless C major bright. Um, tonality um, when you go F sharp to go from F passing tone up accacciatura appoggiatura from above the dominant so under and above without to pass through the dominant creating therefore a melodic diminished third interval My fingers slipped to the G to 
explain it when in fact he elliptically avoids it. And this is the only diminished third tense chromatic uh, elliptic uh, interval between all the other uh, ones that are very um, diatonic part of C major or G major. shorter version of the um, bass line, uh, the digest, not to be precise. Now you see how immediately that flat 6A flat acts as a dramatization, sort of a romantic era to become, but not yet, um, minor or major, the flat 6. Major third is a relative major of the minor sonata that we have not fully major, nor fully minor, but half minor major. Minor, major? I know it's cheesy to call it loyal, so, or <laughs> smile with a tear, that's even more cheesy. But in Bach, it's not so much major minor in terms of mood setting, since in Baroque music, I personally don't find that they are as attached to that psychological manipulation. It's more about creating a sense of delaying the arrival to the dominant. Some editions until the 19th century ending added the sixth fourth in minor, so much they thought it would perhaps disturb the virginity, so to say, of the C major without sharp and flat tonality for the first period that he sort of organically chose to display, but he has this tortured chromaticism that creates also a sense of false relation between the two A's in the right hand tenor, I mean alto, and the bass. And not just um, adds a very choosy place where to chromaticize this diatonic um, sunshining C major. Another thing which is to take in account also is that um, the arpeggiation um, is a way to define what a chord is. Root third, fifth, possibly seventh, and then on. So if you if you do the root C the third E the fifth G and then you play <clears throat> after the third another root in canon and then after the root and the third you play another root. So if you play them in succession on the same octave, you see the inversions of the uh, functions of roots, thirds, and fifths. So when you play the root, the third, the fifth, the root, and the third, or the tenth at the level of the octave, above, it does have this harmonization, but it's written melodically as a design of arpeggio that releases its fragrances of the different intervals that are constructing it um, in a way that the plucked chord stresses but doesn't release. Regardless of the plucked <coughs> technology of the harpsichord <coughs> sound production, <coughs> excuse me, a voice, teachers talk too much and they lose their voice. <coughs> like singers, they should play their voice. So, um, the position of the chord versus the arpeggio in terms of the melodicized interval, the gestural spacing between the sounds and how much of them hold and how many of them in one hand without pedal 
you can, you can only hold two at most. Perhaps three, but not. Like the first cello suite. Which in an acoustical resonance with the empty strings which resonate on the cellos, its own resonant body. You obtain a certain launching of a chordal element that in fact unleashes itself and presents itself melodically to you as a listener. So there is a delicious ambiguity. Is it chordal as a chorale or is it arpeggiated intervals or is it a bit of both? And since 19th, 20th century musicians are used to play music where the melody is usually on the top, when it's on the bottom, then it's more difficult to follow because we tend to wish to be... When in fact the melody is down. desire by Bach to start the prelude and fugue series for each tonality and each mode uh, chromatically uh, by one that sort of defines the tonal centered expectation, the tonic, the dominant with the second degree, the tonic, the subdominant with the plagal, so that you present the different hierarchy of importance of the degrees in the organization between the leading tone, the tonic, the subdominant, and you modulate to the major secondary dominant, like five of five, five of four. Or you do go in G major or F major according to the proportions of staying in that other tonality in terms of cadencing in it. Uh, it can be argued, and it is argued, but ultimately what matters is regardless of the opinion is while you play it, to maintain that pristine C major seven sounds stressed into step motion from the seven fifths, of which the first and the last are the tritone devil in music, that creates the tension release. And then when you introduce first F sharp, you realize clearly that you're going to the dominant key or the dominant or the key of the dominant, but in any case you go in G. secondary dominant, but it's already constituted in a two bars um, chords uh, connection, immediately shorter than the amount of chords it takes you to resign in, in C major after you did it in G major, passing by because of the shortness of their passing through 5 of 2 and 5 1 uh, secondary dominant and regular dominant with a minor 9 which chromatically adds to that darker sonority and not not even so you add a little bit of spices to subdominant uh, to um, secondary uh, dominant leading tone 5 of 2 you drop in this pristine, clear C major little um, alterations. First F sharp, then C sharp, B flat, A flat. So in a very short time you get 
get uh, too many chromatic um, notes that don't belong to the tonality. And soothingly, you take the time to re-establish C major purely so, without any additives. And then only five of four, which in fact is one four, but because you add an extra third to the chord of a fifth triad, you add the seventh. tones, semitones, closing to the dominant. Then you have a dominant ostinato. You could have continued. Anyway, the dominant um, extended stay usually is like a fermata or an ostinato. The main tonality's note, which is the dominant, that's why we call it dominant, because it justifies the tonality more than the tonic, which only gives the name of it, C major. So if you were to play it as a um, fast-forward um, browsing through the pages, Visualize clearly in proportions the real notes, the alteration guest notes, the proportions of balancing between establishing briefly in another key or just passing through another secondary dominant but in the main key, which in the slow tempo of the display with twice repeating each harmony, which is soothingly almost mesmerizing, almost like as if hypnotizing, as if the micro overtakes the macro and you get to forget even anything about what you're doing, it's all like blanking. It reminds me of the opening of the moonlight sonata by Beethoven. like in the Waldstein Sonata, the accompaniment of a K310, which needed a melody, here it's, it's all chordal accompaniment, melodically thematical, all in one, and all in one. And it's very important to take in account the textures, of the melodic experimentations or hints, or sometimes um, giving the listener the opportunity to imagine what it's not compared to what it is. And I think that um, for the pedagogical aspect of the piece Bach considered these pieces to be the, his prelude and fugues, was very important because each prelude has to establish the tonality in which the fugue will express the knowledge of the polyphony. And therefore, if most of the preludes should be vertically written like chordal aspects, then the fugues will present the Renaissance motet writing. Never play. 
teacher, Mademoiselle Boulanger, was on her deathbed, and her assistant, Mademoiselle Dieudonné, after that too, not shortly, but still a few years later, both of these ladies were sort of in their mid-90s at that point, um, had learned the solfege, the theory, the music grammar at an age 80 years earlier, at least 85 years earlier, of really toddler children. So it becomes a second nature, just like a mother tongue. And the well-tempered clavier was, of course, the um, basic breakfast food, you know, the cereals of music making every day. And so they were reading, no, they were reciting because they couldn't sing in their deathbed voice by voice fugues to maintain their brain from totally decaying before their body totally gave up when they were uh, bedridden. And it was a very striking... Um, vision to see how the power of the brain has to go as far as possible to pull the, the body to hold and the spirit to um, bond them because of course you cannot the one without the other but in fact they remembered them and they would stay in their bed and go do re mi fa sol fa mi la re sol and when I visit them, I start so la si do re do si, and I recite the other part, and we would spend hours just reciting, remembering favorite preludes, or rather fugues in the preludes, because, well, unlike most preludes that should be all vertical and fugues horizontal, most of the preludes aren't always vertical. So you could do the same on the prelude too, uh, it depends on the piece. But in general, the voice leading of the motets, uh, learning from the Renaissance onwards, um, is reminiscent in Bach's fugal writing, which was already neo-baroque for his time, but he didn't call it so. Uh, already uh, the old wig, as his own sons called him, because he was so austerely old-fashioned in his own time life, compared to ballet opera, and uh, more music of the feelings and the expressions and the attitudes and the theater and all lightnesses and frivolities, rather than the just beauty, purity, and meaningful an expression of what only the melodic line of each voice leading part is and not for what it could represent if it's attached to a mood. So, in fact, uh, these fugues were their exercise to maintain their brain sanity when they're afraid they're going to lose the last um, connection to um, uh, consciousness, in fact. And in a way, I was very touched to see how these um, non-robot ladies had the robotized memorization of these um, austere works and layeredly so because they remembered them by voicing since they didn't play them cordially and it would be like do re mi fa so fa mi la re so la so fa mi fa mi do re do si la fa sharp so fa mi fa re mi fa so so la in fact the fa and sharp or dies in french um of course, you have to say it in the pitch, but if you cannot sing it because, <clears throat> like me, you broke your voice singing too much solfege as a child, or like them, uh, they couldn't even barely breathe, let less eat, but they could still solfege Bach um, to maintain their um, connection to their world, in fact, even if it's almost a lost um, entity, a sort of um, Atlantis. Uh, to which they hold on by their education in music terms. Uh, well, my um, father, who was a solfege, son of a solfege teacher, mother, my Bulgarian grandmother, he came with a system to solfege the diatonic notes do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, and the sharps in German, cis, dis, vis, gis, eis, or be, as, ges, es, bes, for the flats, and so combining both cis, re, dis, mi, fa, fis, sol, gis, la, i, si, do, which allowed to have a syllable for an um, chromatic note or an alteration. So you would go do, re, mi, fis, sol, rather than do, re, mi, fa, sharp, or fat, yes, sol. If the pitch didn't uh, justify, justifyingly express it, you could at least say it. 
but Mademoiselle Boulanger was only saying do re mi fa without the sharp. And unfortunately, um, her old age altered her um, ear um, physiologically to the point to which she could hear everything but the semitone higher, which disturbed her a lot. And which challenged me because then I was asked as her student to play my prelude in fugue practicing a week a day. Um, but only for her transposed on the piano so she can hear it in its original key according to her perception of the pitch, which was not that easy. Of course, the first prelude you can play in C sharp because it's less complicated in terms of texture or in B major. is more tricky to play improvisatory imp modulation, not modulation, transposition in white or black into black keys and well, that was another story. But in any case, what I meant to say is that the knowledge of these fugues was the sort of central fact of knowing the Bach prelude and fugues and the preludes as I started with the first one were there to establish the tonality in which the fugue will blossom its um, polyphony and therefore the virtuosity was the voice leading rather than the speed of the fingers of course the speed of fingers was mostly for the preludes for most of them like <laughs> D major book one. This is a subject has 30 seconds, so that's four fingers too. And then very long values. Double dotted French overture. But most of the time the fugues are not there for finger virtuosity, they're there for um, musicianship virtuosity, a voice leading organization. Beauty in intelligence, intelligence in beauty. While the prelude was more mood setting in relative Baroque terms, as well as mostly tonal establishing. And so, how does he establish? One, two, five, one. Second or subdominant, or or second or subdominant, dominant, and then the leading ton, tonic, and so you have a cadence to start and establish your tonality, and then flourish it a little bit, but let it blossom in the fugue. And uh, so you don't choose, pick and choose which prelude with each fugue, but you can at least um, prepare the fugue in the prelude uh, so that the tonality is already familiar. So you establish sort of an um, ecosystem for the fugue to blossom. That's what I think it is. And most of them start with a definition in the prelude's tonal um, identification signature by the subdominant as the first um, indicator, for instance, E flat major, which is the next after the D major. Um, bypass D major, which is one, two, five, one, two. Could have been. But anyway, you could ex exchange them once you know their. Um, their uh, I was going to say anatomic structure, almost like in the medical terms, and then dress them up in the patterns of another one, like... Becomes... Or becomes... Um... Well, anyway, and um, so the point was that when you go to E-flat major... Dominant un 
under the tonic, which is the fourth degree. And then the tonic, which is with the dominant, the fifth above itself. So we call it subdominant because in the scale is under the dominant, but in fact is dependent to the dominant, the fifth under. minor, one, four, five or seven. So it's one, two, five, one, one, four, five, one, one, five, one, very rarely in fact. Come to think of it. How can one not come to think of these things? As Mademoiselle Boulanger used to say, these works are like good companions of a travel which would be life. So, travel companions of life who reveal themselves differently at different seasons of your life's journey, but they never fully release all of their um, hidden or obvious beauties or uh, enigmas. Which is nice because it keeps you alert. And in a way, it has this pedagogical Bach vision that. Um, the more you study them, the more you learn how to learn, and therefore the more you discover things in them. And it makes you feel like you're entering deeper and deeper in layers of meaning, touching to certain levels of truths that are only discovered by you. Not only for what you're told, by whom you're told. And you discover a system how to reach for these truths by yourself. And then once you organize this in your blueprint thought, pattern, then you construct your imaginary structures like an architect. And then the interpretation comes on top of it with the seasons of life and perhaps instrumental techniques as well as, of course, capacity to indulge into certain levels of structural organization of bars or ever every battle and then just let it all flow naturally even if they're structured in a certain austere way terms of phrasings and um, yeah it's a gift that keeps on giving the more you discover similarities between let's say tonal signatures of preludes in the first book or the second book the more you realize that there are infinite variations to the same theme how to establish myself in a tonality more or less bluntly, more or less subtly, more or less chromatically, more or less diatonically, more or less in combination of the two, with patterns that allow to delay, display, organize, prepare, uh, collide, sometimes um, sort of um, provoke the dissonance. <laughs> with upbeats, with hemiolas, um, with um, uh. So in a way, learning them first as notes, then as patterns, then as melodic lines, going from the letter to the syllable, to the phrase, to the stance, to the stanza and then to the complete poem, you learn them from the root up as if you compose them by writing them from memory as I had to do every week before I play them. So that you know them unrelated to your fingers, but then once you start playing them in your fingers, through your fingers and through the piano, they immediately attach themselves to a mood. So I just play G sharp minor almost randomly in front of you. I cannot play it just for the point of it because I don't feel it. But I connect it to a mood that is dreamy and but is unrelated to my knowledge of its structure with tonic and then two, five, one, and how he delays the high note. So I appreciate, I taste each of these uh, beauties that are in the design or in the structure or in the combination of the two. And they reveal themselves differently with pedal or tempo. I remember calling one day um, Professor Richter, who was my piano teacher for a few amazing lessons, 
Sviatoslav. Because I owned LPs with the well tempered clavier he recorded in Russia or Soviet Union in the days of Melodia LPs label, I asked him if he could enlighten me. How did he choose the tempi for the recording, thinking there might be a reason, a structure, a rule? Um, no. He told me the next day I would have done something differently. So, in a way, destroyed all my um, Gouldian desire to have some kind of a unit of thought that applies to each in a structural way, defining it, like the eighth note is this, or the sixteenth note is that, and then multiply them to obtain this in 12-8, this in 6-8, this in that. No, it was more like he played them as mood pieces, he told me, whenever Mademoiselle Boulanger taught them to me as structures, which they are. And when I play them, inevitably I play moods on the structures, because it's human. But in fact, that doesn't mean that is the final solution. In other words, the interpretation is not part of the knowledge of the pedagogical aspect of their existence, is knowing them as a grammar. And then you do something with the words, and sometimes something different from the alphabet that you learned for the given language. I think in that sense, the well-tempered clavier is really um, a language, uh, sort of a mother tongue of tonality for um, pianists who want to learn repertoire way beyond Bach, of course, until Ravel included, who uses tonality in a like all of the composers after Bach use tonality, but in their own adapted way, until some Schoenberg onward decided to break the mold and entirely question that order of things. And so that written knowledge of the piece, disconnected only from the finger memory of playing it, allows a pianist to um, really develop a sense of um, musical thought that can be applied in other pieces like a Chopin um, ballad without to try to romanticize Bach or try to let's say baroquize Chopin it's just that it's not to do with the style it's not to do with the mood it's to do with the yeah, with the structure would be the anatomy. In fact, the well-tempered clavier is a good skeleton for medical musical students. Never thought of it as such, and it sounds a bit gore. But factually, you can dress up each prelude in a different um, outfit with its own structure. And in fact, the structure is more important than the dressing, which can be changed. That's very much of a freeing aspect of music making, that you're not slave to the melodic line, but you flow with the structure of the organization of bars, rhythm, melodic punctuations with cadences. In fact, you speak your Bach preludes more than you play them, or through playing them you speak them rather than you only sing them. In a way you fantasize them, as C.P.E. Bach said in his essay Versuch in German, Fantasieren am Klavier. I like to fantasieren am Klavier too, so much. <laughs>
Thank you.